today we have something special for us as a church, something we have never done before, and we're excited to unveil that for you today. But before we go any further, I want to welcome all of the men that are viewing with us right now over at Riverbend and Deberry. We got some incredible guys. Guys, we love you. We're praying for you. We're believing in you. Church, come on, let them know how excited we are that they're with us this morning, watching and hanging with us. We're so excited that you're on the journey with us, and we love you guys over at Riverbend and Deberry. So here's the deal. Here is what we are doing this weekend. We are, we are calling this our New Communicators Weekend. We've asked five communicators to get an opportunity to preach. Now, why are these guys up here? It's because they are a part of team. They have been serving. They have been pouring their hearts and souls into building the church at Connect. And, and one thing that we want to highlight is we're saying new communicators, not young communicators, because this is important because as through the life of our church, there's gonna be volunteers and people and staff and team that are gonna be coming through. And you may be in your 20s or you may be in your 80s and you're a new communicator. So it just doesn't matter the age. What matters is the heart and the preparation and the time and, 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 the, and the right season for you to come up and give a message. And so what we did is we sat around at a table as a staff and we said, who are the five people that we really want to see? And these names popped up to us and we were like, yeah. So we got all excited and we went to them and asked them. And a lot of, a lot of them gave us the deer in the headlights look like, you want me to do what? Where? And you want me to do What? And where, it's like, you already said that. You're going to be just fine. And after some prayer and some fasting for some of them and us punching them, uh, they all accepted the request. But here's the deal. There, there's some things that go into this that is really important. You need to know we have some ground rules that, that are for these guys. They can't just get up here and, and preach and just go and, and, and hopefully they'll end. No, we gave them five minutes, Okay. We gave them five minutes, and they, they, they have been fighting and scratching and clawing to get this thing down to five minutes. People, you don't know what I've put up with for the last month, okay? <laughs> Just pray for me, okay? I almost lost my Christianity a few times. I'm kidding. They've been amazing this whole time. But they get five minutes. And what's happened over the course of a month is we've met three specific times, and then we had a full run-through. Uh, we met as a team, and... and Elise gave us everything that we were doing. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We picked what we wanted to talk about, something that was uh, meaningful for us when it comes to David and his heart and his passion for, the, for God. And so they got to pick their characteristic that they wanted to talk about today. And then they kept uh, winding it down to five minutes. Some might go a little over, um, but it's good, it's good. And then what we're going to do is we're going to cheer them on. That's the biggest ground rule to this all. We want to encourage them. We want to preach them down. This is where if you have a hanky on you, it is your opportunity, y'all. It is your opportunity. So I was thinking of some ways because I always, I always know that you get more out of something when you respond to that something. Uh, you get something out of it when you start responding. That's why worship takes a different level when we start raising hands. And if you've got a too tight sh shirt on, it's fine because you can just go here and it's good and nobody knows. And then it's just to like say you have big arms. And it's like, I love you, Lord. And then you're looking at the girl across, what's up, girl? Um, it's fine. It's fine. I'm sorry. What's up, girl? My wife's on the front row, just so you know. Um, good job, guys. And we want to preach them down. So here's some things that if you're not used to preaching people down, you, know, you can use these today. And, and you can just simply say, preach. But you got to say it with some inflection, some, some, some oomph and some energy. You can't just be like, preach. First off, nobody's going to hear it. And we're going to think you're sick. And an usher's going to come and be like, okay, can I get you something? You coughing? You got to say it with some energy, some excitement. You got to Preach. If you need something, you know, some fun things to say, you could say, uh, preach it, white boy. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. This is not universal. This doesn't work for everybody. You, you can't have Elise and Joy get up and be like, preach it, white boy. Especially for Elise. She ain't white and she's definitely not a boy. So you got to figure that out. You got to learn when to use things, okay? So you got to figure that out correctly. My favorite is watching actually Pastor Ashley in the front row. Um, because when she, when she gets something good, she's like, that's so true. That's so true. It's so true. It's so true. 
But the best thing that she does, she doesn't, you don't realize she's an assassin, y'all. Because when she's saying it's so true, she's looking at you smiling. And what she's, she's not smiling like, ha ah, that's so great. She's smiling like, ah, you need Jesus. He's talking to you. It's so true for you. Whoa. Okay. And I always feel those looks because I'm right over here. And she's like, it's so true, Todd. It's so true. It's so true. Okay. So now you got the ground rules. You understand what we're doing. Five minutes, five preachers. Uh, you, we're going to encourage them. We're going to clap at them. We're going to wave them down. You're just going to give them your all this morning. Does that sound good? And, and here's the deal. One thing that's really, really big too is that uh, they all would want to honor our pastor. They don't have time. So what we're going to do right here as a whole, we honor our pastor, okay? Because they would get up here and for like eight minutes be like, we love Pastor Devin. He's changed my life from the inside out. And we just don't have time for it. So what I want to do is on the behalf of our team that's preaching today, we love you. We honor you. We thank you for the opportunity. And I know they're all amening me right now. And I think for a lot of us, we can say that we, I don't know if we would be here if it wasn't for you guys investing into our lives, believing in us. So thank you for trusting us and trusting us with your platform. This is a very big deal for us and we love you guys so very, very much. We have the best. I think we really do have the best. And I think sometimes what happens is we can lose sight of how great we, we have it because maybe we've been here for years and, and some of you are like, speak to yourself, Todd. I know who Devin is, okay? He's my hero. But... Don't lose sight of how special we have it here and how amazing our church is, our church family, and our pastors who are leading this thing. And there's just greater days ahead of us because we have leaders who are hearing from God and investing into people. And there you go. We're excited to be a part of this today. So what we've done is we started a series last week on the character of David. And it's a character study on the life of David. And Pastor set us up so beautifully last week. And one thing I wanted to highlight was he, he talked out of 2 Chronicles 16, 9. It says, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I love what the amplified version says at the end. It says those whose hearts who are completely, watch this, completely his. What a beautiful statement. And you know what it makes me think, does God stop and pay attention? Does God stop and watch and listen and look and think and process? It makes me think as if when I've ever experienced a special moment, have you ever experienced something in life that's special? I always go back to, you know, when the Seahawks destroyed the Broncos in the Super Bowl. It's a special moment. It was a special moment. Uh, years ago when uh, my father and I went to a Dallas, uh, Dallas uh, Cowboys and Seattle Seahawks playoff game and Tony Romo fumbled the snap and the chaos that was that game. It was a special moment. I remember when I got baptized at 16 years old, special moments when you know that you kind of, in your mind, you step back and you recognize what's happening in the moment and you say, this is special. Uh, there's something here that I need to recognize. I need to gain the moment, understand the moment. And I just wonder what causes God to stop and recognize, listen, and pay attention. And when you think about the character and the heart and the life of David, obviously God stopped and said, there's something special. I can, I can imagine him peering down from heaven and grabbing some angels and be like, guys, guys, come here. Look, 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 look. Look at this shepherd. Look at this, look what he's doing in the midst of just serving out in the wilderness, out on his own. What he's doing, he's writing, he's, he's, he's loving on me, he, he's talking to me, he, he's talking about his frustrations and he's talking about his hopes and his dreams. He's giving me his whole heart and, and God said, I'm gonna strengthen this man and I'm gonna give him a heart that mirrors mine. And I think it's so important to understand that God isn't talking about this man after his own heart, that he's not, David's not perfect, He's still a man. He's not a God. He is a man after God's own heart. God is perfect. David is imperfect. But the great thing is, is what God does in David's life, he, he begins to strengthen him. He begins to equip, equip him, empower him, train him, take him to, to, to new levels. And, and I think there are some things that we can learn from David's life. And our message today, if you're writing this down, I would take this, is the five, characteristics, sorry, the five characteristics of David. The five characteristics of David, things that we can learn that I believe when God stops and he begins to look at David, he begins to give him these characteristics. He empowers him, enables him. His Holy Spirit begins to build him, the man that he was called to be and meant to be and would be. 
God began to enable him and empower him. And there's five characteristics, and each one of our speakers are going to give you a different characteristic. Are you guys ready? So we've got our first speaker, and he's been serving here for a while. He, he, he's what we would call a music director for our team. He plays the guitar. He's really, really good looking. He's tall, dark, and handsome. Um, his number's going to go up. On, I'm kidding. It's not. Uh, he is single. Come on, give your hands. Get, put your hands together for Riley Demery, y'all. Riley, Riley. <laughs> David was certain. David was certain in the power of God. Thank you for that. Certain in God's sovereignty. He's certain in God's plan and God's purpose. Because David had this certainty, he's able to pursue peace on an astonishing level. And so I want to look at an example of this in Psalm 3 and 4. When David wrote these psalms, he's in the middle of running from his own son Absalom who's trying to kill him. Okay, and if you study David, you'll see this happens a few times in his life. Someone's always hunting down David, trying to kill him. He's like sleeping in caves, writing psalms about it. So he's got some experience on the topic, okay? So we'll start in Psalm 3.3. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. And he ends Psalm 4 saying, in peace. I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Because of David's certainty, he's able to peacefully sleep in this situation where he could literally be killed in the middle of the night. Okay, now, I don't know about y'all, but I've lost sleep over things not nearly as intense as that, right? I think we all have those things that have the ability when we lay down at night, they can consume our thoughts, fill us with anxiety and fear, whatever that problem is related to, whether it's marriage, relationships, a financial issue, a health issue, workplace problems, you fill in the blank. If David's able to experience peace in this situation, that's available to us too, all right? There's one big thing that David understood about peace that we need to get. And if you're taking notes, actually, you should write this down if you're not taking notes. Usually a peace problem is a perspective problem, okay? I'm gonna say that again. Usually a peace problem is a perspective problem. We have the wrong perspective. We don't have this certainty that David had. I'm going to read this, this uh, verse in Psalm 4, David writes, Tremble and do not sin. When you're on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Did you catch that? David just gave us a tactic. He gave us some insight into what he does when he's laying down at night. He's not laying there thinking about his own problems. He begins searching himself internally. He has this dialogue with God of, God, I know my own son Absalom is trying to kill me, but what do you want to do in me? What do we need to work on? Because more than any earthly problem relationship, this vertical relationship is where our perspective should be. That's what's more important. A vertical perspective will bring you horizontal peace, okay? What does God want to work on in you that you're allowing your fear, your anxiety to distract you from? That's what David filled his mind with, right? Spiritual growth. What's the next step? God always has, wherever you're at, he always has a next step in your spiritual growth, okay? And maybe this next step for you today is really simple. Maybe on the way out of here, you need to go by the Connection Center in the lobby or go online, grab yourself a soap guide, start beginning your day with some scripture, observation, application, and prayer, and fix your perspective vertically. It's got to be consistent. You probably need to do it at night too, right before your head hits the pillow. Fix your perspective again. What does God want to do in you, all right? Focus on what that is, not just what you want God to do for you, okay? Here's the thing, though. It can't end there. Because God didn't intend for our relationship with him to be isolated. You need people in your life to remind you of who God is and who he says you are. And David had that. David had that in his friend Jonathan. All right, and we read this in the soap guide this morning, if you're following along. Samuel 18, 1. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. I love the way the message puts it. It says, he became David's number one advocate. I love that. Who's advocating for you in your life? Who's encouraging you? Who's there that has the influence to speak into your life, help you correct your perspective? Because you can't do it on your own. You can't. I've tried it. You can't do it on your own. And we take that seriously at Connect. That's why I have this little thing. You might have heard of it if you've been here for an hour. It's called Connect Groups. Signups are online. You got to get in a group. You got to get some Jonathans in your life that want to be there for you. They want to walk through life with you. Right? And if you've already done that, you're awesome because you're a step ahead of the game. You know what I'm talking about. 
You know what I'm talking about. You're going to that group and you're receiving. You come every Sunday, you're receiving, you're leaving encouraged. People are meeting with you, helping you out. Now listen, is it possible it's time for you to start doing that for someone else? You're being equipped to have an eternal impact on someone else's life. Who's in your life that needs you to be a Jonathan for them? Maybe there's just one person you need to call this week. Actually, you need to call them today. They need some encouragement. They need you getting coffee with them, walking alongside them, being there for them. Trust me, you'll experience fulfillment, joy, and peace that you didn't know was possible when you become a part of someone else's connecting with God, experiencing what you've experienced, receiving what you received. Trust me, it'll rock your world. Peace that surpasses our understanding is what he wants for us. It's available to us. And I don't mean to make light of anxiety and of fear. That's a complex problem. It really is. But this is the first step, y'all. If you haven't started here, this is the first step, all right? It's got to be consistent. You got to start keeping your perspective vertical. Get some people in your life that love you, that want to help you do that. Today, today can be the day for some of you to start pursuing peace in a new way. It's available to us wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, whatever it is that consumes your mind at night. Like David, we can experience that same peace. And guys at Riverbend and D-Berry, you're not exempt from this either. Right where you are at, you can be sleeping peacefully at night, pursuing God, growing closer to him, begin walking out your purpose. God is that big. He's that powerful. He wants to do it in us. Will you receive that today? Amen? All right. Come on. Give it up for Riley. <laughs> All right, now you see what we've been doing. And they're like, okay, he can preach. <laughs> David was certain. All right, our next communicator. Uh, she's been serving for a little over a year. She's been serving in our student ministry. She's leading our middle school uh, connect group. And she's crushing it at life. And so we're just so proud of her. And you know, when you have a middle school, a middle schooler in the group, she's like a little spy and she doesn't even know it. And it's like, how did group go? And I have ulterior motives. I'm like, tell me everything just so I know. And she's telling me how much she loves this person and how encouraging she is and how full of life that she is and how loud she is. But it's amazing. Can you give, put your hands together for Joy Cherry? Hello? David was human. 2 Samuel chapter 11 tells the story of David and Bathsheba. David walks out on his balcony, he sees a woman, and then everything from then on goes downhill for him. David made the choice to lust, which turned into adultery, which turned into murder. Then he had to cover up the murder. Because of David's choices, he had landed himself in a very dark place. I can relate to David in this sense because I know for me personally, my actions have landed me in some dark places. I can personally recall times that I've made mistakes and then I tried covering them up. Mom, you remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Although David was a man after God's own heart, he was still human like the rest of us. You know, one could wonder if David ever asked himself, why keep going? This is the mess up of all mess ups. How can I go back to God? after this. And I want to, if there's anyone in here today that might be feeling that way, I want to let you know that you have a choice. This building is very special to me. Nine years ago, I walked around these halls as a high school student, but as a very different person. If I'm being honest, I was what you would classify as a worst case scenario. Uh, I didn't give anyone any hope to believe that I was going to be better or that I ever even wanted to be better. So real quick, I want to tell you something about sin, and I want you to write this down. Do not miss it. Sin always takes you further than you want to go. Sin keeps you longer than you want to stay, and sin always costs you more than you want to pay. With that being said, February 14th, 2008, I was 16 years old and a sophomore in this school. Uh, on that day, I found out that I was pregnant. Um, I love my son, and he is the biggest light of my life. Um, but this colossal mess that I had brought myself into made me realize that I now have a decision to make. Like David, I had a choice. I had two choices. One, I can let this dictate how the rest of my entire life is going to pan out. Living in a constant state of pain, rejection, and darkness, never knowing 
true happiness, never finding a purpose for my life, then there's option two. I can humble myself before God. I can repent to him. I can submit myself to him. And I can choose to live my life in a way that meets his expectations. So what sets, David apart, what sets David and I apart is that we chose option two. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 20, we read what David did. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord, and he worshiped. David messed up, and he suffered a very difficult consequence. But he humbled himself, and because of that, God saw it, and he favored him even after a fatal mistake. If you're out there right now and you're at rock bottom, you are tired and you are exhausted and you have come to realize that living life your way just isn't working anymore. You pick yourself up off the ground, you humble yourself, and you submit yourself to him. Because if David's redemption was not enough, let me be the walking, talking, living proof of God's grace. Because the same building that I walked around in while in the darkest place of my life, pregnant at 16, is the same building that God placed me on as a strong woman of God to deliver his word by God's grace and his purpose that I am up here today. The sin that Satan wanted to use for bad, God found good in it. And it's being used to glorify him. So I want you to ask yourself right now, what if your life experiences... The things you've been through, the trials, the tribulations, or the things that you're currently going through could possibly ch- save someone else's life. Would you submit yourself to God today? Knowing that there is someone out there that's waiting to hear that story because stories save and people can relate to your stories. So just like David and myself, God wants to take that bad and he wants to turn it into something good. You just have to make that choice. Come on, let's give it up for joy. How good was that? That's one of those where sometimes, you, you know, your response is you just stand up and walk away. It's just, I got nothing to say because it was so good. David was human. Our next communicator has been newer to our church. He's been here about eight months, and he's been walking with Pastor Devin and Ashley, and I've had the privilege of getting to go to breakfasts with him at like 7.30 in the morning. Uh, I didn't know God was up that early, but it's cool, uh, because he has a real job and does stuff in the morning. Uh, And we've just gotten to know each other, and he's jumped in to serving in our connections team. His wife is serving in our children's team, and they're just an incredible couple. And I knew the first time I met him, and I sat down, because, you know, you can hear it from somebody else, and they're like, he's incredible, and it's like, okay, I'll see. Um, And I'll sit down and be like, let's see how incredible you is. And he starts talking, and it's like, wow, this guy's really intelligent, to the point where I was like, I'm uncomfortable, because you're so awesome. Um... I'm not going to introduce you to my wife because I don't want to lower the expectations of what she's expecting from me. I love you, boo. All right, put your hands together for Tyler Medina, y'all. Yeah, I want to focus on the characteristics this morning of David uh, that I don't know about if you need it the most, but I know that I need it the most, and that characteristic is patience. Psalm 27, 14, David says this, Wait for the Lord, be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. David knew what it was like to wait on God, and it was his relentless patience that made him so usable by God. See, last week, Pastor Devin touched on the fact that David was a teenage shepherd boy, and God called him out of the field one day to anoint him to be king. That one day, he said, David, one day you are going to assume the throne in the palace. But David did not immediately go to the palace. He sent David back into the field. And what was so interesting about that is David had to have a relentless patience in order to see the promise of God fulfilled in his life. That David would not see the throne until his mid-30s. Now, how many of you in this room, just a poll, a quick poll, just raise your hand. How many of you would say that you're patient? Raise your hand. Okay, I got some. All right, let's see how patient you really are. This is called Tyler's Patience Test. It's scientifically proven to show if you're really patient or not. Trust me. Here's the scenario. You pull up to a red light and the light turns green, how long does it take for you to honk at the person in front of you? 
Cannot tell you how many times I've heard that little voice in the back seat of my daughter going, honk, honk, beep, beep, because she hears dad press the horn one too many times. <laughs> it's so funny because that when we're, when we're thinking about where we need to go next or the destination we're trying to reach, we immediately throw patience out the window. If I'm taking my wife out to, to dinner, I'm just, I'm gunning to get there because I want, because I know that's my destination. And so say, Tyler, it doesn't work if we're dead. So, <laughs> I just got to get there. And I throw patience out the window. Why is it that David could be patient for about 20 plus years to assume the throne, but I can't wait an extra five minutes for my coffee at Starbucks? Why is it that, I, I, maybe, it's, maybe I'm just preaching to myself, but why is it that, that maybe we let frustration choke out what God's trying to do in our lives and the promises that he's already spoken to us? Why is it so hard to wait on God? And maybe not for you today, maybe it's just me. I've come to find that in my life, I'm usually the most impatient, or I'm the least patient where I'm trusting God the least. That I am the least patient where I'm trusting God the least. Why is it that David can be patient? Why is it so hard to wait on God? I love what David says in Psalm 62, 8. He says, trust in him at all times. Why don't you say all times? Why don't you look at your neighbor and say all times? All times. And here's the reason why David say, said that. David said that because he knew that the one who gave the promise is the only one that can fulfill the promise. That the one who gave the calling on his life is the only one that can bring the calling come to pass. David understood that I've come to let someone off the hook today. You've been frustrated waiting on the promises of God. You've been angry and bitter and, and, and just full of resentment because you haven't seen what God said he would do yet. Why don't you say yet? I've come to let you off the hook today and know that you do, it's not your job or your responsibility to fulfill the promise of God in your life. It's your job to trust the promise of God in your life. It's not my job to get into a calling or open a door that's shut. It's my job to trust that the promises will come to pass because the one that said it is the only one that can fulfill it. I remember when my wife and I, we first got married. How remember, how remember that first month when you first got married? It's awesome, right? I remember I was working this job, barely making over minimum wage, and right before uh, my, wife and my wife and I said, I do, she actually lost her job. And so we get married, we go on the honeymoon, uh, we come home, and, and we're living on one income. And, and I just remember how stressful that was. I remember when the frustration started to mount. I remember when the pressure started to settle in. And I was driving to work one morning, and I just, I, I remember, I was, at, I was just at my end, and I yelled out, and I said, God, we need more money. And if I'm transparent with you this morning, I, sometimes I still yell that on the way to work. <laughs> But it was like, it was like immediately, it was immediately just a shot through the heart. And I felt the spirit of the Lord speak to me and say, you need more of me. And just re very repentant, I just said, God, I don't need more money. I need more of you. And just like only God could do that same day, someone walked into uh, our office area and struck up a conversation with me, offered my wife an interview. He had never met her before. And my wife got a job that day because of, that's something only God could do. And it was like God was testing me. He said, where's your faith at? What are you trusting? Who are you trusting? Are you, will you just give fresh trust in the promises that I told you I would take care of you? Will you put your trust in me? Usually where I'm the least patient, it's where I trust God the least. So where are you the least patient today in your life? Where are you trusting God the least? This is what I want to end with today. To see, David was a shepherd boy. And he likens God to a shepherd. Most of us in this room, we know Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. How many of you in this room today, how many of you know there's no such thing as an attack sheep? There's, there's no like right wing forward sheep. There's just sheep. David understood something. David knew that if a sheep was going to be fed, if it was going to be taken care of, if it was going to be protected, that a sheep's greatest hope was to find a shepherd. And then if a sheep were ever going to do well, if they were ever going to be good, it was only going to be because they found a good shepherd. I've come to tell someone today, you have a good shepherd named Jesus. You have a good shepherd and that everything he promised you will come to pass. Every dream he's put in your heart will become a reality. Every calling that he's put on your life, that door still can be opened. It is, it is the promises of God that we have to hold on to. It's your job to trust in it and to be patient in that process. So may you trust the good shepherd today like David did. May you trust in his word, trust in his promises. May you be patient in the process. Because that's, how the, that's the key that will unlock the door to seeing the promises of God fulfilled in your life. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for Tyler. Wow. David was patient. Speaking to one of the 
probably most difficult parts of our lives is to be patient. I, I, I was writing down mentally a whole bunch of things there. That was incredible. Uh, incredible. So we're going to continue this thing. We are a little over halfway through it. How are we doing so far? Are we doing good? <laughs> Love what's happening right now. Our next communicator, he's been serving on the team from the beginning. I think he's been, I think he and his wife have been here the longest, or one of the longest. They've been around Pastor Devin and Ashley for like years since they were embryos. It's fine. Uh, and they have, they've grown so much, learned so much because they've just been in this leadership, been around. They know the heart. Anytime you want to know something about what they would want, go ask these two because they, they just know. Um, and sometimes it's really annoying, but it's cool. Um, <laughs> But he, he's a drummer for us. He is a part of our worship team. He gives massive influence into our worship team, leads with such great, incredible persistence and love and joy and peace, and it's incredible. Can you put your hands together for Caleb Miller, y'all? David was confident. For so many of us, when trials come our way, we tend to lack confidence. A lack of confidence is oftentimes an identity issue. When we don't know who we are, we don't act confidently when the trial comes. Throughout David's life, we see that he had confidence in who he was, and because of that, he was able to do extraordinary things. I want to start out in a very familiar passage of scripture. It's found in 1 Samuel 17, and it's the story of David and Goliath. Now, before you check out and say, Caleb, I've heard this story a million times. I get it. David, the underdog, defeats uh, the giant Goliath. I want you to stick with me just for a moment. And I want us to look at this story a little bit differently, how it can apply to our lives. So picking up the story in 1 Samuel 17, verse 45 through 47 in the message version, this is David talking to Goliath. David answered, you come at me with sword and spear and battle axe. I come at you in the name of God of the angel armies, the God of Israel's troops, whom you curse and mock. This very day, God is handing you over to me. I'm about to kill you. Cut off your head and serve up your body and the body of your Philistine buddies to the crows and coyotes. The whole earth will know that there's an extraordinary God in Israel. And everyone gathered here will learn that God doesn't save, listen to this, by means of sword or spear. The battle belongs to God. He's handing you to us on a platter. The battle belongs to God. What an incredible confidence David had to fight Goliath. David was able to show this confidence because he knew who he was and he knew the battle belonged to God. Let's look at the word sword or spear in the context of the scripture and just give some meaning to what that is. So the sword and spear is significant because this signifies the most commonly used uh, weapons of war during this time. During ancient warfare, there were three kinds of warriors. You had cavalry. These were the men on horseback and chariots. You had heavy infantry. Those were the foot soldiers armed with swords and shields, that was the most common, and you had third, ar artillery. These were the archers, but more importantly, these were the slingers. Slingers had the advantage in battle because they could hit targets from 200 yards away. This wasn't a child's toy. This was an absolutely devastating weapon that gave great advantage to armies that used slingers. You have to also understand that slings had the stopping power equivalent to a 45 millimeter handgun. I mean, that's a lot of power. A lot of us don't, we, we think of David going up there with this little slingshot and hit da Goliath right between the head. He was skilled in what he did. The sling was David's weapon of choice. So when Saul tried to put his own armor on David and give him a sword to fight with, it was a no-brainer for David to use a sling. Going into fighting Goliath, so many of us read the story as if David was at the disadvantage because of how big Goliath was. But in fact, not only in one hand was David at the advantage because of the way he fought, but more importantly, he was at an advantage because of why he fought and who he was fighting for. Some of you are here today and you're facing a life in your life. You have people all around you encouraging you to fight this giant with weapons you were never created to fight with, just as Saul encouraged David to fight with a sword. Instead of going to the word to find your confidence, you find your confidence in yourself or what's comfortable and you fight on your own. You're coming up against a giant and you're lacking the faith to face it. These giants come in many forms, marital issues, financial issues, addictions, 
anxiety, fear, and depression, these are all very real things. The fight seems way too big. The risk seems too great. And the pain, it seems way too much. But can I encourage you today that you can defeat the Goliath with the right weapon of choice just as David did. You have to understand, if David would have chose to fight with the armor that Saul, that, with the weapon that Saul gave him and fought Goliath with the hand-to-hand combat, he would have died. But David chose to stand firm in his identity instead of stepping into the identity that Saul was trying to create for him. Listen, and it saved his life. Will you fight the way that everyone else fights? Fighting the way that's common or will you commit to the uncommon and fight the way you're created to fight? In other words, is your confidence in your ability to defeat the enemy or is your confidence in God and how he's created and equipped you to defeat the enemy? And as David stood firm in his identity and used the weapon that God gave him, I fully believe he began to recount the victories that God gave him in the past. His faith began to rise up in an uncommon confidence, rose within him that could not be held back. I can imagine David standing there talking to King Saul, and he says to him, bring the battle. I'm ready now. I've got something for Goliath. This should be your attitude with whatever Goliath you're facing in your life. Be encouraged today that God can bring you out of shame, out of guilt, pain, sickness, bondage, and give you the faith and confidence to defeat the Goliath in your life. And if you believe that, say amen. Come on. I've got something for Goliath. I don't know. That'll preach right there. I get all fired up and I'm like, yeah, let's go. Okay. David was confident. Our last communicator of the day. She is incredible. She is fierce, which would be a really good word to describe her. She is strong. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, No, here's the thing that's amazing about this uh, communicator that we got coming up. She would be a guard, and she is a guard against non-cultural things for our culture. And sometimes people will overlook that kind of gift and skill. But what she's done is she's been able to pick up the heart of our pastors and say, this is, this is the line that's been drawn and this is who we're going to be and nobody step foot. And if you step foot over it, I will cut you. Um, Cause that's kind of grace in which she leads with. She's incredible. She leads out almost every single week in our worship, but this is a different arena to come in here. Can you put your hands together for our incredible next communicator, Elise Miller. You ready? David was teachable. In this statement, Pastor Devin beautifully unpacked this for us last week. So I'm just going to springboard off that message, but focus in on two areas I believe David exemplified teachability best. And those two areas where David modeled that for us without a doubt for me was in his struggles and in his service. Let's look at his struggle. When it came to struggle, it's no secret David went through difficulty as we've all pointed out today from rejection as a boy to being doubted when he confidently claimed that he could defeat Goliath, from having to flee for his life uh, to adultery, then to murder. And then if you read, continue reading all through 2 Samuel, it is a mess of family drama. You have rape, you have murder, the list goes on and on. David went through struggle. But what the beautiful thing about David was that even in the struggle, you find reading Psalm after Psalm, David's response to his struggle revealed a teachable heart. One that responded always with sincerity and purity. Time and time again, David repented. He refocused and he stayed the course. He realigned his mind and he returned to knowing who he was and where he was called to be. And ultimately, David knew he was called to be king. However, I believe he also knew one other thing and that was the importance of God's timing. And God's timing timing was greatly impacted by David's willingness to display honor. 
And David's spirit of teachability shined when he made the decision that on the journey from shepherd to king, he would choose to honor Saul and he would choose to honor God. And my second point today, which is in service. Even as a young boy, after David was anointed to be king, what did he do? He went back to tending sheep. As far as we know on record, he didn't try to pull Joseph and get his brothers to bow down prematurely. No, David was faithful until he was called to play for King Saul at the palace. And then David was faithful until he had the opportunity to slay the giant. And David was faithful even when fleeing until Saul stopped the pursuit of wanting to take his life. And in 1 Samuel chapter 24, we see a moment of the ultimate service. And this is where I wanna land for us today. Here in this passage, Saul's hunt of David comes to an end. And at this moment, David has the opportunity to take the throne into his own hands and kind of speed up the process by killing Saul, but he doesn't. What does David do? He spares Saul's life and he shows Saul mercy. In the natural, it seemed like the perfect setup. And even David's friends were telling him in verse four, his friends were saying, this is the day the Lord Lord spoke of. He is giving you your enemy to deal with as you wish. In other words, his friends were saying, hey, David, this is such a God thing. Can we all relate to kind of using that as an excuse? Oh, I feel this is a total God thing. Just go for it, just go for it. But David didn't listen to his friends. He made a decision to silence the voices around him and tune into God because in his heart, he knew that Saul was still anointed at that moment to be king. And he humbled himself and he chose the path of honor when it would have just been easier to do his own thing. And when on the outside, it seemed easier. And some would even say justified to end Saul's rule and reign right then and there. He didn't take the easy way out and eject from the path and plan and purpose God had for him. Instead, he submitted to God's timing and process and order. And he silenced the other voices to tune into the one voice that really mattered. And this led to him not only taking the throne, but look at this with me. In addition, he received the blessing of Saul, his enemy. In verses 19 and 20, we see, We see Saul's affirmation of David's anointing to be king. This is a huge bonus that only the Lord himself could orchestrate because of David's patience and because he waited. David's commitment to have a spirit of teachability and the sorrow of struggle and the submission of service, that is what developed his character for kingship. And I ask you today, this morning, can you do as David did? Can you submit and serve someone else's vision while you still have a vision in your heart? Because God's timing will be greatly impacted by your willingness to display honor. Yeah, you can clap for that. And then lastly, can you silence the other voices surrounding you and tune into the one that matters to give you the strength and stamina you need to do things the right way in the right order while you wait. So that like David, you can pray as he did so beautifully in Psalms 25 when he said, show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me for you are my God and my savior and my hope is in you all day long. If you wanna go from shepherd to king and if you wanna be called by God himself, a man or woman after God's own heart, You too, like David, must embrace the sorrow of struggle and the submission of service. And let me encourage you this morning that in the midst of sorrow, in the middle of God's timeline being worked out, and in the very mundane of service, listen to the one voice that really matters. Put your hope in him. And then like David did, lastly, make a commitment to pursuing a teachable spirit. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for Elise. Way to end that. But can we also give it up for all five of our communicators today? What an amazing job they did. The preparation, the heart and the passion that they put into this, they just did way above and beyond, to be honest with you, what we were hoping for. This was so great. 
And I, 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 I truly believe that God is speaking to you today. And, and what's so great about it, it just doesn't matter the age of a communicator. They can communicate to right where you're at because we are led by the Holy Spirit. We are not speaking from our own thoughts and our own words and our own ideas. These are God's ideas. And the Bible preaches to every single one of us. And so I hope and believe that God is speaking to you right here and right now and is beginning to already change some perceptions and mindsets that you have going into this. There, there were some takeaways that I had last night, and I kind of created a statement. I wanted to read that for you. It says, certainty is built through my human struggles, while my patience creates confidence in God as he lays out the path for me to take all, to take all because I am willing and teachable. There's so much in this. And there's so much going on. But the greatest thing that we can truly learn from the character of David was that all of this was prepared in the quiet. I think sometimes in life we get so consumed with the big. We want the moment. We want the opportunity. We want the next thing. We want to go to the next place. We want, we want the promotion. We, we, want the, we want the marriage now. We want the kids now. We want the thing now. We want the house now, the car now. I want it now. But what we got to understand is that these things, promotion is prepared in the quiet. And David would find himself in these places of quiet. And what he did is he would begin to sing out to God. There was no audience. There was only sheep. There was only darkness. There was only stars. There was a guitar. And he would play it. And he would sing to God. And he would tell him his thoughts. And he would tell him his heart. And he would tell him his frustrations. And he would tell him his even depressions. And he would tell him everything. And, and it it just challenges me so much. Do I have that type of relationship with God? Do I have that experience with God that God would stop and listen because I'm crying out to him, reaching out to him, going to him? I love what he says in Psalm 139.1. He says, God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. And that he says, I am an open book to you. I think sometimes that can be actually really scary to say to God because at most parts of our lives, we are constantly holding the darkest parts of us aside, even to God, when he can already see him, when he has already knows, he's already aware, he perceives all, knows all, and he knows who you are. But what's funny is we lie to ourselves and we hide the, the worst and the darkest parts of us aside. And what if we could just find ourselves at this place that David would constantly find himself, this characteristic to be real, raw, and open, and to say to God, I'm, I'm an open book to you. And would you begin to change me because God, only your Holy Spirit can change me. And would you begin to equip me because only your Holy Spirit can equip me. And would you begin to help me to get over these things? And would you help me to walk out of this frustration and this bitterness and this depression? And would you help me to move on so that I can be everything that you called me to be and everything that you see that's within me? Would you help me? And I think for so many of us today, we, we find ourselves in this place where we can be challenged by one piece or all of it today of, of our five characteristics. But this one thing that I would pray is the next step in your life is can you find yourself in the quiet places talking to God about the change that needs to take place in your life? Can we find ourselves in the next step of our life to say, God, I need to be real with you. I need to be honest with you because I don't want to just have a showy relationship and I show up on Sundays and I raise my hands for worship and I carry my Bible with me and people would categorize me as a, as a Christian, but in my quiet place with you, you and I have no connection. Because this is not the life that we were meant to have. This life that we were meant to have is that Jesus would look at us and say, friend, and we would look back at him and say, savior. And today, can we take a next step? You see, it's not, take, it's not about taking leaps. It's not taking massive jumps. It's about taking a step. And will you take a step in your relationship with Christ? Whatever it may be. I don't care if you've been saved since you were five or you just you committed your life to Christ yesterday. Will you take that next step? Will you find yourself in the places of quiet and allow God to speak to you, to change you, to equip you? Because I, for me, I want to be in such a place that God, as he ranges throughout the whole earth, looking for those hearts to strengthen, that he would stop and say, who's that? 
Who is praying and, and communicating and he won't stop and he just keeps going and he keeps going. And I know who, not God knows who I am, but I want him to stop and take notice and go, wait a minute, guys, come look at this. Look at his heart. Look at his passion. Look at his zeal. And he just won't stop. He just keeps going. And life hasn't been perfect and life hasn't been easy, but he won't give in and he won't give up. And he begins to enable me to be that much more and better. Can that be for you today though? Can that be your situation? You know, it was so cool. We was talking with Caleb before this, and, and I hope he's okay with this, but there was nerves coming into this. But he said something that I thought was so profound, and I think it's profound for this moment, is he said, I hope I look back on this in five years, 10 years, whatever, and I look back and say, that was the day I said yes to something new in my life. Will you say yes to something new in your life today? We allow God to do something new in your life today. And, and I know for so, I'm speaking to so many people right now because I'm speaking to myself because that's what the Holy Spirit does. I want to pray with you. And I want you to just be real and honest and bold and just, can you just go to God this morning and ask him to do something different in your life than you've ever experienced? And I'm not telling you you have to have all the answers. I'm not telling you you have to have everything just perfect. You don't need to be a theologian. You don't even ever have to ever read the Bible, but today could be a new step for you. And will you ask God to do something new and significant in your life? And will you take a step with us? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let's go to God. Father, we thank you for this message today. We thank you that you are speaking to us and enabling us today. God, I pray right now as we begin to talk to you and cry out to you, God, that you would help us to solidify this moment, that this wouldn't just be another day. This isn't just another message. And it was, it was fun when they did that thing at church. No, this was that day when I look back years to come when God, you did something significant in me and through me. That when I gave you my everything, that I stopped holding things back from you, the darkest parts of me, God, have been revealed to you because my life is an open book that you can begin to speak into. Will you reach out today? Father, heal us, restore us, enable us, challenge us, give us more today. God, I pray your Holy Spirit takes us to new places in our relationship with you and that we would truly never be the same as we walk out of here. In Jesus' name, with every head still bowed, every eye still closed, I wanna ask you what I believe to be the most important question is do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? H have you asked him to be the leader and the Lord of your life? And if you've never done that before, I want to give you an opportunity right here and right now to make Jesus the leader and the Lord of your everything, not just your salvation, but your daily choices, your daily life, the direction in which you go, the choices in which you make, the life in which you lead, that he would be your everything today. Or you may be a second individual in here saying, you know, Todd, I've made that decision before, but I've kind of turned my back on God. I haven't had that closeness, that connection. I wouldn't call myself a Christ follower, uh, and I need a radical recommitment right here and right now. Today is, is your opportunity, friend, to make Jesus the leader and the Lord of your life, to make Jesus that, that radical reconnection this moment right here and right now. So here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to simply count to three. And when I get to three, I want you to be bold and courageous. And I just want you to slip your hand up and then you can just put it right back down. Why do I ask you to do this? Because I believe if you do an outward expression of an inward decision, it solidifies something inside of you. And it, it signifies to God, I'm taking this seriously. I'm ready to move forward in my relationship with you. And I'm ready to go to new depths with my relationship with you. So if you've never accepted Christ today or you need a radical recommitment on the count of three, just be bold and raise your hands. One, two, three. Three, go ahead and lift your hands up this morning. Awesome, hands going up all over the place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God sees your hands. He sees your heart. He knows your situation. That's what I love most is God sees you today. He knows where you're at. Radical recommitments taking place in the house today. So here's what I wanna do. Everyone together, whether you raised your hand or you wish you would have, you've been saved your entire life, I want you to, to join in with this prayer together. Everybody say this with me. Say, dear Jesus, I ask you into my heart today to be the leader and Lord of my life, to forgive me of all my sins, and to give me a brand new start. I pray in this moment I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we?